My name is Marco Staffney, Executive Director of the Montreal Museum of Science. We're so happy that you could join us today for our author talk with award-winning author and illustrator David McCauley. His books include The Way Things Work, How Machines Work, Zoo Break, The Way We Work, and Black and White. He's received numerous awards, including the Caldecott Medal of Honor Awards, the Boston Globe Horn Book Award, and the Washington Post Children's Book Guild Nonfiction Award. At the Montshire, we work to awaken and encourage a lifelong interest in science, and we love David McCauley because he takes complex scientific concepts and helps readers understand them through warmth, humor, and amazing illustrations. So thank you so much for joining us here today, David. We're so excited about your new book, Mammoth Science the big ideas that explain our world. Thank you, it's great to be here. We're happy to have you here. And my first question, of course, is why mammoths? Why mammoths? Well, that's easy. Um, uh, The mammoths crept in to my work in 1982, 1983, somewhere in there, when I was working on the way things work. And um, I was, really panicked about doing a book of 400 pages of machines. I just, I never done anything like it. I haven't done anything like it since, but um, what made me nervous was that's a lot of machines. And I was concerned about how I would keep not only my readers interested, but how I would keep myself interested. So I needed some, some catch, something that would be a little unusual. So in this sketch, I'll show you the sketch and I hope you can sort of make it out. Um, mm-hmm. This is the, you see the whole piece of paper. It's, this is a typical uh, slice of um, tracing paper, what I use, a sheet of tracing paper. And up here, you can see I'm making charts, diagrams of the different kinds of levers. Um, and that's sort of the information that was available to me and so on and so forth. But at the bottom, something else happened. And if you can see down here, Oh my gosh. Very first time, there's a lever lying on the ground with no fulcrum underneath it, but there's a mammoth surrounded by people. And it struck me that because these, uh, some of the simple machines, levers and inclined planes, were probably used in ancient times by cave people, that there may very well have been mammoths and saber toothed tigers around at the time. And, um, and that's why I scribbled it in. It was just like popped into my head. And uh, then I began to think, what could I do with the mammoth? I mean, yeah, I could humorous to have a mammoth, but this is one of the very first sketches of the mammoth learning his role or her role. I don't really know. I don't distinguish. Um, uh, on, a, on a lever, and you know, obviously you move the weights and so on and so forth. If you want to weigh the mammoth, as you see over here, I realized that all I had to do was have the entire village of cave people stand on one end of the log and the mammoth on the other. And when the log was horizontal, I would, I would know that the weight at one end was equal to the weight of the other. So all we had to do then was weigh the individual uh, cave people. Um, trying to weigh a mammoth. I mean, think about it for a moment. Uh, <laughs> uncooperative would be an understatement. But here's one of the drawings from the way things work. And a couple of things to note about it. Uh, it's on real paper. It's painted with ink, colored ink. Um, and it's also just in two colors. When this book came out in 1988, it would have been too expensive to do a 400 page book in full color um, by somebody uh, who was not known for doing this kind of thing. They were, uh, the publishers were scared. Uh, So we decided to split it 50-50, 52 color, 54 color, and then alternate them. So if you go back and look at that edition, you may or may not have noticed. I hope you didn't notice because the whole idea was to keep the differences between the two color and the four color as minimal as possible. So that's where the mammoths came from. And then about a year ago, year and a half ago, Dorling Kindersley, the publishers of the original Way Things Work, contacted me and they had sort of decided to approach me about bringing the mammoths back after 30 years. Um, And the mammoths were delighted. I mean, you know, they've been basically (laughs) at work for 30 years. So um, they were were delighted for the opportunity and they were even more delighted for the fact that they didn't have to be around machines on every page. They could now investigate the wonders of science. And, you know, that was, that was, that was a big hit with them. So I did say yes. And that began the project. And um, 
th that brings up the, the, the connection uh, uh, with the publisher in this case. These aren't coming up with a book called uh, Mammoth Science or even the way things work. I mean, that wasn't my idea to do a 400 page book on machines or another 160 page book on science. Uh, these, th this is from DK in London. And uh, my job as the illustrator is to sort of attempt to work with the lists and whatnot that they've, that they give me with the structure they've kind of established for the uh, arrangement of information in the book and bring it to life, make it engaging in a way that readers of all ages will have a smile on their faces um, as they're reading all these technical things, all these scientific things. I would, as a teacher, always prefer to be looking at a class of people who were not laughing hysterically, that makes it sort of difficult, but smiling um, and appearing to be receptive to the information that they are about to confront. So that's, that's, how, we, that's how we did this. And that's my sort of philosophy for the mammoths and so on and so forth. And for any book I've done, if there's been an opportunity to, in, to add a little humor to the information, at the technical information, the building information, whatever it is, I'll do it. But you can't do it in such a way that you basically uh, overwhelm the technical information. It has to be, mm -hmm. although we got pretty close in mammoth science uh, by giving the mammoth center stage. But um, it's important to sort of create that balance so that they know it's a real book. Um, and the information is reliable. Go ahead. Well, absolutely. In the, I, it, so I grew up, of course, reading your books, and I, I loved them. And there are so many things to explore and um, be revealed when you look at your books. What books inspired you uh, growing up? Um, encyclopedic books are so ripe with information. And as a kid, you get so excited um, about learning more and more and getting all of that detailed information. Uh, did you enjoy books like that as a kid? Um, well, we didn't have a lot of books. Uh, most of the books we had in my house, uh, as I was growing up in the north of England, um, it, you know, I was born in 46, so through the early 50s, um, most of them seemed to be about the Queen, uh, which is fine. I mean, everybody should have at least <laughs> books on the Queen on their bookshelf, but there wasn't that much else on the bookshelf. But when I was 10, I um, was given an award at which meant I could choose a book. And so my mother and I went to a bookstore in Bolton, Lancashire, and the book I chose was, in fact, a golden book um, published for the English audience, so the spelling was obviously different, uh, called the um, Big Book of the Big Book of uh, Science for Boys and Girls, something like that, by Bertha somebody I forgot her last name, and it's double page spreads, not dissimilar from the from the book we have here, but it, it was a larger format. It was quite a large book. It's it's at the Norman Rockwell Museum at the moment, unfortunately, part of another show, uh, or I would hold it up and show it to you. But it was a book that had uh, different kinds of scientific information um, in geology and botany and biology and so on and so forth, each devoted just, just one spread. Um, but sound, um, mm. music, smell, and all that sort of stuff. And for me, it was fantastic because it was like having my own museum. The, the page with the, all the rocks on it, on the geology spread, um, I just, when I, when I walked to school, back and forth to school every day, which was a wonderful walk in and of itself, um, I was always looking for the rocks that I had seen in my encyclopedia. So it connected me with the world around me, even though I think in retrospect, many of those rocks were probably found in Africa or Egypt or South America or wherever, not in Lancashire. Um, mm -hmm. but, but that didn't matter. The spark was lit. And that's what I hope, you know, any book I do lights the spark of curiosity. Um, I don't ever want to give all the answers, but I, I certainly want to encourage readers to ask as many questions as they want. Well, let's talk about how a book like this actually gets made. Um, so you talked about how inspirational one of those spreads on geology was for you. You have so many different topics that are covered in mammoth science um, that it's all of science, basically, that's in there from what is life to uh, basic physics and action and reaction. I know we talked about one particular spread here, action reaction, um, which has all sorts of things happening in it. You've got a, a mammoth being uh, jettisoned down into the air. You've got mammoths down here. How, how does a spread like this or a book like this even get made? Well, first of all, 
start with the organization, start with the, with the choice of that subject. That's all part of the DK editorial process. So I get a list of 80 spreads from one to 160. And oh. I see the sequence, I see the families that they've broken it down into and all that sort of stuff. And then with any luck at all, I get a very concise description of what it is they want to get across um, with this spread. Now that's where we often have difficulty because I usually, I mean, not usually, but I often find that it's not clear enough to me what it is they really want to say. And let's face it, you could say anything, you could go in any direction with these things. But gradually, we, we, we come to some sort of an arrangement and I say, okay, I've got it figured out. I know what we're trying to do now. With that spread that you just held up, um, the, uh, the, the, the sort of rockets on the, on the mammoth, um, that was part of it, the thrust, the upward thrust and, and so on and so forth, the downward force. Um, creating a, a surface off which the mammoth lifts with other mammoths on the ground watching mysterious, you know, this mysterious action, this explosion. Um, the little diagrams that appear on the pages, those creep in later as we, as we discover what things need to be clarified more. They, are, they sort of carry the heavy load in a way. Um, the big drawing is really meant to capture your interest, your imagination, to engage you and to put that smile on your face. And they're, they're all for that, which is really wonderful. So I do work with a terrific team in that sense. They have their own experts. So we make sure that everything we say and everything I illustrate is accurate. Even if it's wacky, it has to be accurate, except for mm -hmm. the fact that there's a mammoth flying in front of you. That's the one thing that they let me get away with, but that's okay, it, it, it works. There's another one here. This is one of the hardest ones I ever did. Um, this is the simple machines all combined together to carry an orange from the tree, which is over here, to a slicer, which is here. The whole point of this collection of simple machines is to basically cut an orange in half. Hugely mm -hmm. complex for that reason. The, 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 th the two things that made it really difficult is that first of all, I had to include all the simple machines um, in a way that would be accurate but I wanted to include them in a sequence that could be mounted on a two-dimensional mammoth, a, a big sort of mammoth wall that could be rolled around because you have to keep moving it from orange tree to orange tree. Once you've finished with one tree, you move on to another. And the shrews are doing much of the operating, as you see here, pulling on the rope to pull down the lever, which will, which will pick up the, um, the orange and then they'll let go and it'll launch it and it'll end up here. Uh, and so on and so forth. So all the simple machines are there, but this was a dog because <laughs> I really wanted it to be convincing and, 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 and playful and accurate as well. So you could in fact take any one of those machines off this and figure out how it's operating, what it's doing and so on. But um, that was a challenge. They, once they let me go, I, um, I go into my sketchbooks. And I have a couple of sketchbooks that look like this. Now this is just filled with sketches because I'm reading what they're sending me and I'm trying to figure out what it is they want. And I jot things down, pencil, ink, whatever I have in my hands and gradually can form the beginnings of an idea. Um, but these are, this is critical. This is such an important part of the process. So I would go from a page like this this is the material spread to a drawing like this, which, wow. uh, which, which is an early sketch of what became the material spread. Um, and at this point, I think I've got it. You know, uh, If I run into a technical problem, we'll fix it. But um, these are the, the, wow. you know, this is sketchbook number two, um, The Shrew. Because this is a book of science, I couldn't just make up a shrew. I couldn't even make up a mammoth. I had to make sure that the mammoth and the shrew were reasonably accurate uh, in, in, in anatomically and so on. So I have, I have a couple of skeletons of both creatures, not actual skeletons, um, but mm -hmm. images of skeletons of both creatures on the wall the whole time I'm drawing, which I can keep referring to, to make sure that the um, proportions and whatnot look believable, that the legs bend in the right way. I walk the dogs a lot, 
And I have spent so much time over the last couple of years watching the dog's back legs and forelegs move. And, you know, once you realize that you're basically looking at arms and legs and that we can make those same kinds of movements, it's, it's not a surprise. But you forget that when I'm walking behind Astro, for instance, he's a big dog, that huge lower part of the back leg that I'm looking at closest to the ground is not part of the leg, it's part of the foot. It's the, it's the, the longest part of the foot. And the little toes are out of sight. They're in front of, of those lines. I mean, so I, I have anatomy on my mind the whole time while I'm working on something like this because I'm trying to relate it to the uh, stuffed mammoths from La Brea Tar Pits and the mammoths in various states of reconstruction and restoration. Um, because with a book about science, the creatures themselves also had to represent the creatures. Um, life is a part of this, one of the sections in this book. There are animals in it. They, they couldn't be cartoony animals um, as much as they could in the way things work, where it's really about machines. They had to be like real, real animals representing their kingdom. I really love how much visual reference you're using, um, you know, in bringing this. Can you tell us a little bit about your illustrative process. How do you sit down or how do you even begin to draw in your sketchbooks? Is there a special place you go or is it just, um, you know, do you go to your office every day and say, start, start working when you, ha when you have a project like this? Well, a couple of things. I have a great commute. It's about 20 steps um, up the stairs from the house to the studio. But the thing is, I don't have to go to my office. I take this. This is my office. The sketchbooks are my office. Um, and this is where, this is where, in a way, where the good stuff happens. Then I have to come up to the drawing boards. Um, there are a couple of drawing boards here. It depends on which one I feel like working on and which one's got less junk on it. Um, <laughs> and spread out a piece of tracing paper and try to tr uh, transfer from the sketchbook the idea that um, seemed the most promising. And in fact, I may, I also have a Xerox machine or photocopier here, which is one of my prized possessions because it is so useful to be able to take a little sketch you know that it's all in there and it's all working. But if you had to draw that by hand, transfer it by hand onto a 19 by 24 inch piece of paper, you would probably lose it. Mm. If I just throw it on the copier and blow it up 200%, um, I can trace it on tracing paper. And I don't lose what it was about that original little sketch that made me think this is the right one. This is the way to go. So it, part of my process is uh, the photo, the sketching in the photo, in the sketchbooks, photocopying to get the sizes larger onto the sheets of tracing paper that will become the final drawings. Um, and, and then I scan that, those, the, the final drawing with my scanner. I have a super scanner here. Um, I'm fully equipped. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I start to put the color in. And I do it on the computer because I'm not really very good with color. Um, sometimes I get it right, but many times I don't. And if I'm working under pressure to meet a DK deadline, and they don't get around, those deadlines are stupid, I don't have the luxury of messing up a line drawing because the ink or the color didn't work or something like that. I can't just redraw it. Now, there are ways around it. You, could, you can print on sheets of good paper and put color on stuff like that. But the fact is, I'm not a painter. I don't have confidence with, the, with, with paint. I have confidence more confidence with color if I've drawn it like I would be with a, with a pencil or with a pen. So I'm using Prismacolor, colored crayons, so I'm mm -hmm. using markers, something like that. But the whole time I'm drawing the color on, I'm not painting the color on, I'm putting the color, when, when I don't use the, the, the computer. I, in the old days, uh, I did, uh, before, the, before all this fancy stuff, I did, I did paint and just keep my fingers crossed. And then later on, I, you know, I sort of uh, added, the, added color with markers and so on and so forth. But now, as I say, the color is entirely digital. And if it doesn't work out, I just press Command Z. <laughs> and it goes away. And I'm left with my lines. So you know, how long does a process, how long does a book like Mammoth Science take to actually make? Like, what, when did you start to uh, start to completion? I think they allow about eight months total. Wow. Um, so I have to do the drawings probably in about four, four months, something like that. So I, it, I, it's really important that the sketches, you know, that you do all the hard work in the sketches and get it right. Because once you start manufacturing the finished images, which is how I think about it, 
it's not so much fun. You're just under pressure and you have to hold it all together and so on and so forth and hope you haven't made any big mistakes. But it's, it, the deadline's real. Uh, the way things work took three years. And I think that neither of us, none of us knew, DK or me, knew exactly what we were getting into. So that just kind of went on. But DK books, generally speaking, are done in a very strict uh, time frame. That's why they need the good crew at that end. That's that's amazing. I, and thanks for so much so much for sharing your process and uh, giving us a behind the scenes look at how you make one of these books. I'm going to open it up to some questions from the audience right now. Uh, we've got a couple of them that have come in. Um, Carol from the Montchair actually wants to know, what's your favorite animal? My favorite animal? Um, well, I, I mean, I have to say dogs. Okay. Because if they hear that I said something else like mammoths. Or, Astro will be very angry, yes. Or, or pigeons, I mean, I've got pigeons too. A pigeon, at least, who was, a, who was the model for a book called Angelo. Um, no, dogs, my, our, our dogs, mm. they're my favorites. What kind of dog do you have? We have a. Uh, we just lost the the, uh, the labradoodle about uh, two months ago, um, oh, wow. but uh, we have a golden doodle named Astro, mm -hmm. and uh, a Havanese dog named Nemo, and my son has a little Australian miniature something or other um, that he's taken off to school. So they're both getting an education. <laughs> That's terrific. Uh, speaking of education, speaking of education, we have another um, question coming in from uh, Chuck. And Chuck asks, "Do you ever teach it? Um, do you teach? I'll just put it that way. Specifically, you know, we're uh, you're about probably three miles from Dartmouth College. You were taught at Dartmouth, and do you I teach have, generally in the area? I love to teach. I love to teach. But this COVID thing is so distressing because mm. being in the classroom with a bunch of students, I just today put together a final take on the course I'll do at Thayer um, that combines looking at engineering with sketching. I am a strong believer that if you really want to see something, see how it works, notice it, try drawing it. And I don't Absolutely. mean make beautiful art, right? I just mean sketching. Um, if you need to take some photographs of it, fine. But you're, what you will find from trying to draw from the photographs is there are things the camera didn't see. You're going to have to go back and do it again. Um, when you're sketching, you know, you have the opportunity to kind of move around the subject matter. Um, it's not always convenient to be sitting outside and it's cold and so on and so forth. But so I just put this class together for the winter term. I've done it with uh, Vicki May, um, mm -hmm. who really began this, this, uh, this particular course. But we renamed it um, The Way Things Work, A Visual Introduction to Engineering. And, um, and we've done it three years in a row now, but live in that, you know, we could build models and all kinds of playful stuff. Uh, I have to sort of live without that now, um, but I'm, I'm eager to get back in there, even though it is, it will be remote. Another technical question from Chuck that came in a little bit later. What kind, what's your preferred computer to use when oh, you're working on? Mac. A Mac? I wouldn't know how to and use anything else. <laughs> <laughs> and are there any special programs that you use for your illustrations and coloring? I just use Photoshop. Really, I am about as low key um, as you could. I mean, I'm I'm under utilizing this incredible equipment, basically. But I don't have Illustrator or whatever the other ones are. Um, I don't mess around in the cloud. Uh, I just use Photoshop, and in fact, until recently, it was Photoshop Elements because it came with my scanner. <laughs> That's the only reason. So you know, it's not. Uh, not very complicated. Sometimes it's, it, it's not about the tool, it's how you use the tool, right? So if it, if it, it works already, for you. And the tool was already complicated enough. The last thing I needed was like 50,000 more possibilities. <laughs> I'm trying to wheedle it down to something that I can manage in this old brain of mine. So uh, mastery, mastery. <laughs> uh, another question about um, this particular book. So how many drawings, I mean, when you, when you say eight months to create a book like this and four months of drawing, about how many drawings exist in this book that you, you had to make? How many drawings did you do? Well, it's probably about 70 spreads, um, 70 double page spreads. And every double page spread has at least four or five drawings on it. There's the major drawing and then there are the small detail drawings. Sometimes the detailed drawings, like for instance, in the space stuff where I had to draw the planets and, and everything else, those were, those took forever. Those took as long as the larger drawings, but they, they're shot down, they're shrunk down. Um, but you know, making those drawings, that's what eats up the time. Um, and that's where you are literally just drawing for accuracy. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't, I mean, I, was, I didn't have time to be playful with it. 
uh, which I, re I regret, but um, my, my play is within the larger image. So, you, you know, you, that's, how, what, what is that like? 70 spreads times four or five, right? 350. Uh, <laughs> oh, 350. They're, really, they're really small, but, um, and hopefully in a day I would get through, um, it take, maybe take a week to, to sort of go from sketch to finished line drawing, then to color. Um, but I have to do more than one a week. And then I would try to bang out the, uh, the detail drawings um, two, three, four a day. So those are long days. Mm. But um, but you know that the deadline is looming. And uh, another question came in: What's your relationship with your publisher in that way? Can they say we don't like that drawing? Can you redo that drawing? Is there we, is there a back and forth? We talk about the back and forth is precedes the beginning. I mean, the great thing about working on the computer is I can send drawings overnight. So I'm still sleeping while they are looking at the drawings and coming putting their comments together. So that when I wake up and come back up those twenty steps to the studio. Um, the questions are already there, um, and even suggestions, and, and maybe an alternative piece of information. Um, but whatever it is, it's waiting for me. So it's a fairly streamlined process. We never get to a finished drawing and have them say, ooh, that's not what we thought it was going to be. We work together enough, and that's really important, the, you know, the sort of the teamwork here. The, a book like this doesn't, I mean, I, I get credit. I get too much credit most of the time because, mm -hmm. um, I am an illustrator. Uh, I, I, that's what I do. I, I interpret technical information, difficult information, to try to make it accessible, try to make it enjoyable, engaging. Um, and in my own books, write the words and tell, add, add to it a story. But um, in these kinds of books, I, I really have a very specific job in this, uh, in this situation. And um, that's good. That's good. I, must, I, I talked about, you asked me about teaching. The thing is, I, the great thing about being a, an illustrator is you're always a student, especially in nonfiction. That's what makes this so enjoyable. It's, I don't mm. know all this stuff um, when I start, but it's the things you learn along the way that you'd forgotten that maybe you knew once. Um, the joy of being a student, I think it probably sets me up for my teaching because um, I'm still a student, even when I'm standing in front of a room full of students. And they become teachers on occasion too. And then you get this back and forth. So it happens in the professional work. It happens, I mean, the, the bookmaking work and it happens in the, in the studio, in the classroom. Um, uh, speaking so. of uh, teaching and learning, a, a lot of questions have come in. I'll try to summarize them about how did you learn to draw? Did you go to art school? Uh, what, what was your process in, in becoming an illustrator? Um, well, uh, I went to Rhode Island School of Design and studied architecture. I spent five years doing that, and I did a fair amount of drawing, but a lot of model building as well. I loved studying architecture, but I also knew by my, the middle of my junior year, right in the middle of it, that I didn't want to be an architect. There was just too much other stuff, compromise and so on and so forth. So, um, so I um, went through it. I, as I said, I loved doing it, graduated, and then had to come up with something else to do, like a job. Um, I can change my I could change my mind, but then I had to, then it was on me. So I um, I began to start doing some freelance work, some freelance illustration work for you know like the menu co the menu cover at the Ming Garden in Providence, Rhode Island, um, and whatever people would ask me to make an illustration for, I would do it because I was trying to I guess build a little portfolio and and sort of I was dipping my toe in this notion of illustration, and then somebody said, why don't you go and um, um, you know go to a publisher and see if they show them your work and see if they've got anything that. So I did that a little bit. I had friends write stories that I could illustrate. I begged them because uh, I didn't see myself as a writer at all. Um, and, uh, and so that was in 1969, I graduated. By 1972, I had the, um, the idea for Cathedral. So I'd been going flat out and teaching junior high school art um, at the same time. And uh, I had this idea of this gargoyle beauty pageant, which the editor, uh, the guy who became my editor, uh, said um, to me, looked me right in the eyes and said, we don't really need another book about flying gargoyles and dragons and things of that nature. Why don't you just tell us about the cathedral? And I thought, ooh, well, okay, let me, let me see if I can do that. I mean, let me see if I can pull this together. And, you know, he was right. I listened to him. That was me being really smart. Um, and back to the library, 
started reading some books on Gothic construction, which even though I'd been an architecture student, I really didn't delve into. And, um, and I put together a sequence of drawings that simply showed really roughly and often inaccurately how you start with a hole in the ground, you take these pieces of stone, you pile them on top of each other, and at the end, you have this fantastic vision. How does this, you know, why does it stand up? How do you get those rock, those stones up there and so on and so forth? And I answered those questions and by the end of it, I had, um, I had a book. Yeah, and, and you've also had a show. I, I highly recommend anyone to uh, look David up on YouTube and you can watch Cathedral, uh, which was a PBS special in the 80s, I think, um, which yes. is, is just spectacular. Um, I'm gonna end with, I know we have a lot of questions that have come in, but we're just at the end of our time here. Um, if you have one uh, parting gift of inspiration or words of wisdom for future bookmakers or illustrators out there, what would you say to them? Well, after saying just do it, I would say be, be curious. Be curious and work on your craft, work on your, you know, your, your ability to draw and render and so on and so forth. It doesn't have to be fantastic. In fact, if it's just rough stuff in a sketchbook, but you find you are um, uncovering ideas that, that intrigue you, that interest you, that you may have something that could be developed into 32 pages or 64 pages or however many. Um, to be a book. It's really important that it comes from you. And I think that the good stuff that comes from us is, comes because we pay attention to the world around us. We see mm -hmm. it in our own ways and um, we want to react to it. And we want to share what we felt or seen um, as we, as we, in my case, as we wander through our little town, taking a dog for a walk or whatever it is. Um, you know, you, you the, what's going to make the book work is is you, the individual, um, who has a point of view, who has a particular way of looking at things, who maybe has a strange sense of humor, um, but but real, but the determination to take on a project and stay with it until it's done. That it does take that, and whether mm -hmm. it ends up being a four-year project or a three or an eight-month project, um, you know, you can't, you don't know at the beginning. Hmm. So if I'm hearing you right. Just do it, be curious, and just be you, uh, which I think are some great words of wisdom. I don't, David, on behalf of the Monshire, thank you so much. You know, you can find signed copies of Mammoth Science at the Monshire Museum store. Don't forget to visit us during our annual Shop Save Explorer event from November 18th to the 22nd. And you can find out more about that on our website at www.monshire.org. Again, we can't thank you enough. Thank you to all of our viewers today. Uh, we hope to see you soon at the Monshire. And David, I hope to see you walking the dog somewhere in Norwich. Can't miss me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. All right.